lectures lined up. The first is about uh, the dual antiplatelet therapy, DAPT, in uh, ACS. The second is on uh, uh, lipid lowering, how, how low is uh, too low, right? Now to, uh, what about the first lecture? Why should we ever have uh, a DAPT option? Uh, we all know that CT, coronary thrombosis, which was coined in 1911, I think, by an American physician. And the major treatment option would be when we started our life, uh, probably learning about coronary angiogram in 1951. We were using both after bypass and after angioplasty in 1980s. We were using only aspirin in 75 and mostly 150 milligram. They were all doing well. But science always evolves in such a way that uh, every time there are uh, the number of uh, deaths is uh, not reduced sizably. We would like to find out what is the cause. If re-thrombosis is the cause, why not we add one more antiplatelet drug? And then came uh, uh, ticlopidin. Unfortunately, it did not uh, stand the test of time because it produces lot of produced lot of thrombocytopenic uh, purpura, thrombocytopenia as such, and therefore bleeding uh, uh, disorders were more. And then came in uh, late 1999, I think, uh, clopidogrel came into market. And then clopidogrel and aspirin used to be combined from uh, early 2000 onwards. And then the usage of the term dual antiplatelet therapy started coming, which is supposed to have reduced uh, the incidence of rethrombosis after an ACS. Whether the patient has undergone a bypass or he has undergone an interventional procedure, PCI, the incidence of uh, recurrence of uh, thrombosis is reduced when we started using uh, dual antiplatelet therapy. Then came a lot of other drugs other to be combined with aspirin like uh, Pasugrel, uh, Ticagrelar, and all these things. And uh, today, it is a blood thinner world. Just before starting off uh, the meeting, I get a message from one of my young patients, 35-year-old patient, sir, should I have to take a blood thinner? I have just recovered from uh, COVID. So everywhere blood thinner. And people who are going for uh, injection, they are asking, sir, should I have to stop blood thinner? I do not know. Somebody wrote an article, blood thinners should be stopped without knowing the difference between uh, uh, warfare in group and uh, the antiplatelet drug that we use. Unfortunately, everybody asks. Every one of us will be getting 100 calls every day. Sir, should we have to stop? So blood thinners have become probably one of the most prescribed drugs in the world, and it is going to be the most, most prescribed drug in the presence of uh, COVID also. So how well do we use the dual antiplatelet therapy, especially in acute coronary syndrome? To add on to our uh, uh, armamentorium of treatment in ACS, they have started using another drug now, which is uh, a Dovac or a Novac. And in what situations do we combine clopidogrel with a, a Dovac that is directly acting oral anticoagulation. That is, uh, uh, that is the theme of uh, today's uh, lecture. And uh, to moderate that, uh, we have a chairperson and a moderator. Chairperson I will introduce, that is uh, Dr. Murali Dharan. If you want to be a cardiologist today, you can be an armchair cardiologist doing only ECG, probably treadmill also, and also echocardiogram. And then if you want to do only intervention, you can be a catheter reading cardiologist. But if you want to be a more and more of an interventionist, you can be an electrophysiologist. But you want to see an all-in-one, that is Murali Dharan. He is not only an all-in-one cardiologist, he has taken training in every field of cardiology, and he is also a great teacher, and teacher for many of the present-day younger generation cardiologists. And to welcome him, I have the greatest pleasure, because I have been associated with him for nearly three decades. And I always uh, appreci appreciate him, both from the distance and from near, that he's a wonderful cardiologist, continues to be one. And he has got a team whom he will introduce. Thanks. Murali, you can start. Thank you very much, sir, for your kind words. You were always kind to me uh, throughout my career. It was my pleasure uh, to be uh, known to you and to be a uh, friend, junior, a loud person. Uh, he was quoting this quote some time back. I don't know how many of the people in this uh, in this uh, Zoom meeting are on Tamil forum. One quote is a Tamil periyar tamara vodugal one mile lam chalai. That means when you are going to any field, the best character you can have is identify somebody great in that field already. 
தம்பிர் பெரியார் தமரா ஒழுகுதல் கோ சீக் தம் பி ஃப்ரெண்ட்லி டு தம் லேர்ன் ஃப்ரம் தம் கோ ஃபார்வர்ட் ஸோ நேச்சுரலி என்எஸ்கே சார் வில் ஃபிட் இன் டு திஸ் என்னை என்டர் சென்னை ஆசோ தம்பிர் பெரியார் இட்ஸ் யூ ஒன்லி சார் தேங்க் யூ ஃபார் யர் கைண்ட் வேர்ட்ஸ் நவ் இட் மை பிளஷர் டு சே ஃபியூ வேர்ட்ஸ் அபவுட் திஸ் ப்ரோக்ராம் சார் ஹஸ் ஆல்ரெடி நைஸ்லி கிவன் அவுட் லைன் ஆஃப் இட் ஐ எம் கோட் டு இன்வைட் டாக்டர் பிரபாகர் ஃபார் திஸ் ஹார்ட் டாபிக் Uh, can we put the slide of dr prabhakar prabhakar is a very good friend of mine a leading cardiologist a wonderful academician also and the interventionalist one thing that always always uh, makes me to admire in him is the way he looks looks at the article looks at the topic looks at the guideline the vociferous way he puts his points great evidence so every meeting when he comes in i used to learn points from him so it's a uh, aptly has been placed for this particular thing where though guidelines say something the practice says something always a confusion which will be clarified by dr vinod kumar soon so my pleasure to introduce dr prabhakar interventional cardiologist from apollo group well known to everything and uh, his his contribution during this covid time is immense and special thing i would like to say he has a wonderful son a great musician also we always get enthral because he has brought music in medicine in, in because of his son and he, of course him also it's a great pleasure because we are going to have a musical evening let us start with the musical man prabhakar prabhakar the floor is yours thank you thank you thank you thank Mubi. you thank you thank you thank you dr prakasham and dr muli uh, very good friends and uh, dr swakadaksham is known to be by family his father and my father are very close friends i think if you go into nostalgia we miss the topic But I will take off from where Dr. Murali left. Tamil Kriya Tamara Uruzal. App is the app Thirukkural. He said not for himself, but to find out the first among the equals in dual antiplatelet therapy. Because Dr. Murali clearly made an introduction for dual antiplatelet therapy. And look at the history of it. But where we are today is in a state of big confusion. We have aspirin, which is always there, which is number one, always there. But... the position of number 1 is being questioned because nowadays we are talking about an antiplatelet therapy without aspirin the second thing that has happened is what next that is where the thirukural that uh, murli said comes into the picture which is going to be the first among the equals so we have three we have the clopidogrel we have the prasugrel the ticagrel are coming up so within between these three what are you going to choose when are you going to choose how are you going to choose that difficult task is what my friend dr vinod is going to do so we know i will give you the unenviable task of highlighting us of when to start the antiplatelet dual antiplatelet how long to continue and does it go on forever there are a lot of questions to be answered i think i'll just leave the floor to you sir we'll have the discussion more towards the end you know it's all yours thank you so much sir um, it's going to be a great evening and uh, all of my teachers are here to One second, Vinod. Yes. Your introductory slide missed out. No problem, sir. <laughs> We know this uh, a very good friend, very intellectual friend, and uh, he is the consultant interventional cardiologist at Sri Ramchandra Medical College. He's also got a very good private practice. Very vocal, very knowledgeable. Let's listen to him. Are my slides are visible? Yes, sir. Yeah, visible. Visible. Thank you. So, uh, as the note said by Dr. Sivakarachan, sir, uh, one of all my mentors and uh, my daily guru, Dr. T. R. Murli, sir, is here. And uh, Dr. Prabhagar, sir, whom I admire in most of his uh, talks every day. We can see him in this digital platform nowadays. So, with all three in the background, I'm going to present a few data available with us. regarding the comparison of dapt what to be uh, choosed and which group of population which drug is better so that way we are going to see today uh, so this flow is going to be what is the background what is the duration of dapt if it is a dual antiplatelet therapy we all know how long we should continue in which subset how long we should continue that is also very important as prabhakar sir said which drug should come after aspirin whether aspirin should be Uh, toned down in certain patients uh, what should be the drug and what is the dose of the drug what about the special population where this drug molecules are very very essential 
So with a small note, we all know, as uh, uh, Stuart sir was pointing out, DAPT is always now is a term uh, coined for antiplatelet therapy, where aspirin is uh, uh, firmly fixed as the first agent, followed by the second agent, P2 vital inhibitors, either clopidogrel or prosigrel or ticagrel. Or any of these three drugs, when combined together with the aspirin, we call them as dual antiplatelet therapy. Um, now, what is the real issue is, um, uh, initially, when the bare metal stents came, the dual antiplatelet therapy was introduced for one month. Then it rose to 12 months. Then with the evol ev evolution of DAPT trial, it even went to 20, 18 months, 30 months. Then it came back with the new generation of stents. From the after first generation stents, we had the issues of uh, uh, a lot of stent thrombosis. With the evolution of second generation of stents, now uh, the duration of DAPT for longer period is being questioned. And the duration is getting shorter and shorter every day, every month. We now, we are nowadays we are seeing a lot of papers justifying the use for a shorter duration. So, what is correct? When it is correct? What are the guidelines says? Whether it is one month, three months, six months, twelve months, or eighteen months? When should I stop? When should I start? All these things we will try to address via the guidelines. As I said earlier, aspirin with clopidogrel or prosigrel or ticagrel. So uh, uh, the common difference between the three molecules is possible. Uh, we need uh, it's not an active uh, metabolite. It has needs one conversion, whereas clopidogrel needs two steps before becoming an active metabolite. Whereas ticagrel, as you all know, it's a directly an active metabolite. So we will stick on to these three drugs and we will see what uh, uh, what are the loading doses, how to give this molecule. Those things you will see right now. See, uh, if you take clopidogrel, the loading dose is about either 300 or 600 milligram. If you go for prosigrel, if you are going for intervention, clopidogrel 600 mg is good. If you are ready to the prosigrel, it is clear cut, it is 60 mg per oral loading dose. And when it is ticagrel, it's 90 mg, two tablets, 180 mg is the loading dose. What about the maintenance dose? It's 75 mg per oral OD for clopidogrel and 10 mg with the prosigrel and 60 or 90, 90 mg first one year for ticagrel, followed by 60 mg after one year if the patient requires further dual antiplatelet therapy. But in case of prosigrel, we should understand if the uh, if it is weight is less than 60 kg, then we can consider 5 mg daily. Uh, in, uh, uh, in the center where I get trained in Korea, Asan Medical Center, most of the South Korean centers, they use 3.1 to 5 mg of prosigrel because they consider their body mass index is very less and they don't go for a full dose of prosigrel. So it is weight dependent when uh, lower weight people 5-MG can be considered. What about the platelet inhibition? Mm. And compared to clopidogrel, prosigrel and ticagrel do a better job. Similarly, whenever the inhibition goes up, there is a risk of bleeding also goes up with the other two molecules. Uh, what about the peaking effect? Clopidogrel takes six hours. That is the reason why we do a double dosing, about 60 or 600 MG before a PCI. Whereas in prosigrel, the peak effect is attained within 30 minutes. In ticagrel, it is about 90 minutes. Uh, metabolism, so both the drugs, uh, clopidogrel and uh, prosigrel are pro drugs, as we have discussed earlier, whereas ticagrel is an active drug. So, uh, uh, contraindications in acute bleeding is contraindicated. In case of prosigrel, it is uh, contraindicated in uh, history of CBA or uh, uh, stroke, TAA or uh, history of CA. But uh, uh, we see in our center, our interventional radiologist, Post stroke, after intervention, he initiates prosigrel, but uh, probably current clinical evidence only indicates in case of bleeding or CV or stroke, it is contraindicated. Prosigrel is class three as per the guidelines. Picagular, active bleeding is the contraindication. The one of the issues with clopidogrel, what we are seeing is that is uh, patients having genetic polymorphism. About 25 to 30% have this genetic polymorphism, where thereby the effect of clopidogrel comes down. So it is always better to check the platelet reactivity, which we usually do in uh, Ramachandra, uh, before switching over them to clopidogrel. So uh, other two drugs, we don't have faced this kind of issue, but in Tricaglar, we should be careful. When you are initiating Tricaglar, with the dosage of aspirin should be less than 100 mg. But currently in India, we use 75 mg milligram of ecosprin. So generic, we all know, D-plat, plaque, spot plaque. Algorithm of uh, DAPT in patients with percutaneous coronary intervention. See, uh, whenever we are talking about uh, PCI, we have two uh, subsets of population. One is stable scan, stable coronary artery disease. The other one is acute coronary syndrome. So there is always a difference between treating a patient with uh, 
uh, stable coronary artery disease and ACS in terms of uh, antiplatelet therapy. Whenever you are uh, treating a stable coronary artery disease patient, if it is not an ACS, if it is a TMT positive patient, for example, then the dual antiplatelet therapy has to be, if there is no high bleeding risk, then we can continue dual antiplatelet therapy up to six months. Then we can switch over to single antiplatelet therapy. That is, uh, it is class only indication. After six months, if you want to continue dual antiplatelet therapy in a stable coronary artery disease patient, it is class 2B. Whereas in a high bleeding risk patient, if you are going to put a stent in a stable coronary artery disease, then one month of dual antiplatelet therapy is more than sufficient. After that, we can switch over to a single antiplatelet therapy in high bleeding risk patients. Then, whereas in acute coronary syndrome, it is completely different. If, if it is a, not a high bleeding risk patient, you give dual antiplatelet therapy either with prasugrel or ticagrel or clopidogrel along with aspirin for 12 months. When it is a high bleeding risk patient, in AC patients, we can stop dual antiplatelet therapy at six months and switch over to single antiplatelet therapy. Sometimes we consider giving dual antiplatelet therapy in ACS subset of patients with recurrent events even after one year. Here, the dual antiplatelet therapy, even after one year, it is considered as a class 2B indication. Where we calculate DAPT score, if it is higher, then we initiate this patient who have a chance for recurrence of events in life, we give them dual antiplatelet therapy even after 12 months. So what about when the patient goes for CABG? If there is no, if the patient has no high bleeding uh, bleeding risk, then standard straight away you give patients who are undergoing dual antiplatelet therapy for 12 months. If the patient undergoes a CABG, if the patient has a high bleeding risk, if after the ACS the patient undergoes a, a CABG, then you can give six months of dual antiplatelet therapy. Similarly, patients who are ACS undergoing a bypass graft to continue after 12 months, if the chance of if recurrent ischemic event is higher, the DAPT score is very high, then consider giving dual antiplatelet therapy. It becomes class 2B. So, what about? We saw ACS patients who are undergoing PCA, where if it is no bleeding risk, then 12 months of dual antiplatelet therapy. There is a high bleeding risk probability, 6 months of dual antiplatelet therapy. Then we saw in CABG, similarly, no bleeding risk, then low bleeding risk, then go for 12 months of therapy. If it is high bleeding risk, go for six months of dual antiplatelet therapy in case of ACS. Now we are going for a subset where ACS patients are managed medically without an angiogram. If there is no high bleeding risk, then continue dual antiplatelet here also for 12 months. Whereas if they have a high bleeding risk, chances are high, then continue dual antiplatelet for therapy for one month. That is class 2A indication. Then after that, switch over to single antiplatelet therapy. Even in medical management, the chance of recurrent event is high. If the patient had a previous MI and there is a recurrent of event, if there is a high ischemic risk, then even in a uh, patients who are maintained on a uh, dual antiplatelet therapy, we can consider uh, continuing them after one year, after 12 months, it is class 2B indication. Now we are going into ACS patient. What about uh, loading therapy? If it is a non-ST elevated MI, if it is a non-ST elevated MI, pre-treatment with Ricaglar, Propidogrel is class 2A. Unless the coronary anatomy is known, we don't load these patients with prosugrel. Uh, since we have to stop this drug for seven days before taking the patient for a surgery. Once, uh, the pro, uh, once the coronary angiography is done, if the patient is going for a CABG, then continue aspirin, even don't stop aspirin, to discontinue uh, P2Y12 inhibitor after the loading, if you, if you are going to send this patient for a CABG, then it is class 2A indication. Uh, Post-surgery, resume P2Y12 inhibitor as early as possible. Whereas the patient is going for a PCA, then you have options like Ticaglar, Prosugrel, and Clopidogrel. Uh, Ticaglar and Prosugrel are preferred over Clopidogrel in terms of uh, uh, class 2A indication because they have a better uh, ischemic profile, uh, prevention of a recurrent event is better with uh, Ticaglar and uh, Prasugrel when compared to that of Clopidogrel. But uh, when the bleeding is considered, I guess the bleeding is the concern, then Clopidogrel is a better choice among the dual antiplatelet. When you are talking about medical therapy, there is no role for Prasugrel. We have uh, two options, whether we can go with Ticaglar or Clopidogrel. Similarly, uh, in the STEMI, 
uh, you can load either three of them, that is uh, any of the uh, P2Y12 uh, inhibitor. And if it is going for a CABG, discontinue P2Y12 inhibitor, but continue aspirin, it is class 1C indication. Try to resume uh, P2Y12 inhibitor, either uh, clopidogrel or ticaglar post CABG as early as possible. And uh, similarly, in the patients with PCA, you can prefer either ticaglar, posigral, or clopidogrel. When you are talking about medical therapy, there is no role for prosigral. We have either ticaglar and or uh, clopidogrel. And ticaglar is preferred over clopidogrel in terms of class 2A indication, according to ACC AHA guidelines. So now we saw uh, ACS. What about stable CAD patients who are undergoing angiography? Uh, uh, there is a, a to preload them before an angiogram is only class 2B. Because if you, the patient goes in for a CABG, then it is, uh, uh, we have to wait on this patient, discontinue P2Y12 inhibitors. So it's better to do an angiography, know the coronary anatomy, and then load them on uh, antiperspiratory agents like P2Y12 inhibitors, either clopidogrel, ticagrel, or possible if the patient goes for a, uh, a PCI. In, uh, a C, in case of CABG, also post surgery, we can load them with P2Y12 inhibitors. So as we have been discussing, stable coronary artery disease, no high bleeding risk. If it is a DES, what we are doing, we have to give this therapy for six months, dual antiplatelet therapy. After uh, six months, continuing dual antiplatelet therapy is class 2B indication. Uh, similarly, when you are talking about this, uh, in a, in a, a high bleeding risk, uh, uh, what does the European Heart uh, um, Association says? Similarly, they are also saying when you are doing a DES, continue uh, dual antiplatelet therapy for six months. After uh, six months, continuing uh, dual antiplatelet therapy becomes class 2B indications. So it's better in a stable coronary artery disease uh, patients. Both uh, American guidelines and European guidelines concur that you can give dual antiplatelet therapy for six months, following which you can switch over them to single antiplatelet therapy. But if you feel there is a high ischemic risk for this uh, patient, there is a residual uh, 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 lesions, then you can always continue this dual antiplatelet uh, anti therapy for one more, uh, uh, next to six months too. Whenever you are talking about uh, high bleeding risk patients, both uh, American as well as European guidelines says we can continue dual antiplatelet therapy for one month, following which we can switch over to single antiplatelet therapy. Similarly, in ACS, we have discussed earlier uh, and uh, uh, about uh, uh, in ACS, we all know uh, dual antiplatelet therapy is for 12 months, but in case of high bleeding risk patients, you have to give uh, dual antiplatelet therapy for six months. So now we know dual antiplatelet therapy, what guidelines are saying, how to manage an acute coronary syndrome patient at your clinic level, whom we should uh, continue uh, dual antiplatelet therapy, uh, even uh, when, whenever there is a judgmental decision to be made. We can use this DAPT score and then decide upon the whether to continue dual antiplatelet therapy or uh, switch over to single antiplatelet therapy. Uh, the lot of criteria have been used like age, diabetes mellitus, smoking history, currently whether he is a smoker or not, prior MI, what about whether it is a ACS event or not, whether the patient is in failure, what is the nature of the stent used, whether it is a, a CABG intervention, that is venous graft intervention, what is the nature of stent material use, all this uh, uh, relates to gives points to the DAPT score. Whenever the DAPT score is more than two, then the chance of ischemic event is going to be high. There you can continue the uh, dual antiplatelet therapy beyond the recommended period. Or for example, if you want to continue even after 12 months, if, uh, uh, if the DAPT score is high, obviously you can do a uh, dual antiplatelet therapy even after one year of therapy. So uh, how long to use? Default such uh, uh, strategies, uh, dual antiplatelet therapy in case of ACS for 12 months, after 12 months, uh, discontinue aspirin and continue one P2Y12 inhibitor. Uh, what about in patients with high ischemic risk? Uh, uh, 12 months, um, you have to continue dual antiplatelet therapy. Post 12 months, either you can continue P2Y12 inhibitor, uh, as we have been discussing, or even, you can even switch over to low-dose rivaroxaban. That is what our uh, uh, post director, Dr. Swagar Simsar was saying. After 12 months, there is no, not only the choice of dual antiplatelet therapy, but there is a choice of uh, direct oral uh, anticoagulant. That is, uh, rivaroxaban low dose uh, with aspirin is also can be considered. 
or we can even consider a lower dose uh, rivaroxaban post 12 months as a therapy module. Uh, so, how long to use? Uh, as we all know, uh, post ACS event, 12 months of dual antiplatelet therapy is indicated unless the patient has a high bleeding risk. After 12, month, uh, 12 months, uh, du uh, dual antiplatelet therapy, only P2Y12 inhibitor can be con uh, continued. In patients with high bleeding risk, six months of dual antiplatelet therapy followed by single P2Y12 inhibitor or aspirin can be considered. Patients uh, who are presenting with concomitant atrial fibrillation, this is a special subset. The patient who has already had existing pre atrial fibrillation are presenting to the center with atrial fibrillation with ACS, then uh, triple drug therapy are in, uh, instigated for one month. Post one month uh, to 12 months uh, varies. Depending upon the patient, it is, can be individualized. Uh, whether the triple therapy has to be given for one month or three months. Post one month, it is usually dual therapy with uh, uh, P2Y12 inhibitor with uh, uh, oral, uh, or, uh, newer oral anticoagulant. And uh, after 12 months, if the patient has a persistent atrial fibrillation, then we can stop antiplatelet and continue only your oral uh, anticoagulants uh, till, uh, you, uh, as, a, um, uh, as a maintenance therapy. What about the clinical evidence for all this? There are a lot of trials for clopidogrel aspirin combination. As yes, we have discussed, DAPT trial uh, gave us an idea that uh, uh, the strength thrombosis occurs even after 12 months. So it is better to continue uh, dual antiplatelet therapy beyond 12 months. Uh, this was published in 2014. ISR safe uh, clearly showed that uh, there is no major difference uh, with the uh, improvement in the strength platform with six months or 12 months of dual antiplatelet therapy. ISR triple approved that triple therapy uh, for six weeks. There is no much difference between six weeks and uh, six months uh, triple therapy, indicating for a shorter duration of triple or dual therapy. Similarly, we know atherosclerosis study clearly indicated that uh, Clopidogrel is very useful with, along with aspirin in case of stroke patients. And in among PAA patients also, uh, 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 clopidogrel plus aspirin combination has a very good role. And they have been uh, superior, proved superior to individually given aspirin alone among these uh, patients with PAA and stroke. Uh, what about uh, Tricagla? Uh, the uh, 2009 Plato trial. Now we have been listening to Tricagla trials, Plato, for more than a decade now. We all know that um, uh, Ticaglar group has a better uh, in terms of uh, event reduction when compared to that of clopidogrel. Uh, uh, Ticaglar seems to be a better option than clopidogrel for patients with ACS, whom a early invasive strategy is planned. Now with a uh, few uh, bleeding uh, risk going up when compared to that of clopidogrel. What about pre-trial? Pre-trial, uh, see we all know Plato trial did not uh, include patients uh, who are uh, lysed with uh, any therapy, either serpentinase or tenecteptase. So they went again with a three trial. Uh, it's also a randomized control trial where uh, Ticaglar is introduced after 48 hours among the patients uh, who have underwent a lyse therapy. And they proved uh, introducing Ticaglar uh, on patients post lysis also, uh, they are able to achieve decrease in event rates without increasing significantly the bleeding risk. Though there was a, uh, uh, clinically the number of events of uh, bleeding uh, went up, there was no significantly worrisome bleeding among the group with Picagla. So now, even now, uh, even in the subset of population who undergo lysis after 48 hours, initiation of Picagla is safer or similar to that of uh, clopidogrel with just a few uh, bleeding uh, events more when compared to that of clopidogrel. Now we have seen trials like uh, tree trial, uh, and uh, 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 a plateau trial to say uh, clopidogrel, uh, ticaglar is superior to uh, uh, clopidogrel. What, what about the real world evidence? Where we are talking about, uh, always as a clinician, we are worried about real world data. Sweden, uh, Sweetheart uh, Registry is a real world data where they studied uh, patients. Uh, 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 where 45,000 patients were studied with acute MI who were put upon uh, either clopidogrel or uh, ticaglar and they were studied for followed up for 24 months. They found uh, that ticaglar had a uh, decrease in primary event in terms of cardiovascular uh, uh, death, MI and, uh, uh, and uh, uh, CV events uh, when compared to that of clopidogrel. So ticaglar found to be superior to clopidogrel even in the real world data in terms of event reduction. 
so uh, uh, what about now we know we have powerful uh, agents which can have a better uh, ischemic protection when compared to the top clopidogrel uh, what about the duration of the therapy uh, how long uh, we have to prolong this dual antiplatelet therapy uh, uh, cure uh, gave us the idea that 22% reduction in clinical events with dabt Rotterdam uh, experience also showed uh, 65% of stent thrombosis or decreases with dual antiplatelet therapy. When it is uh, when uh, when the dual antiplatelet therapy is discontinued six months, there is an increased risk of stent thrombosis. Duke database also showed that if you discontinue DABT at six months, the chance of uh, 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 recurrent ischemic events are high. All these studies were done on uh, first uh, uh, generation DES. With the uh, uh, real uh, now newer uh, generation uh, uh, DEs are available. Second generation DEs are available where they have become thin steps, polymer free uh, drugs uh, stents are available. With the betterment of the stent platform and the drugs being used, now we know uh, newer trials are suggesting that shorter the DABT trial is also the DABT duration is much sufficient and the risk of stent thrombosis comes down significantly after six months duration. Uh, and uh, now the newer trials like Twilight and Tico are uh, giving us an idea. Uh, one is done in Korea and the other one is even newer, where uh, they are uh, stopped aspirin at uh, third month, end of third month, and continue to recover up to the 12 months. They found uh, that the risk of bleeding comes down when the individually recover is continued instead of dual antiplatelet therapy, where the ischemic benefit of dual antiplatelet therapy is achieved similarly, but the, at the same time, the bleeding component, the risk of giving dual antiplatelet therapy for 12 months is also concurrently uh, stabilized by giving only uh, ticagla uh, uh, for from three months to 12 months. These are the trials that we check, uh, like uh, uh, security, excellent, reset, optimized. They all compared uh, clopidogrel uh, at uh, three months and six months therapy, and they found uh, uh, the shortening of dual antiplatelet therapy is better are non-inferior to continuing dual antiplatelet therapy for 12 months. What about prosigral? We all know prosigral can be loaded uh, 60 mg and 10 mg per hour load D. As I said earlier, when the weight is less, you have to go for 5 mg prosigral. And in uh, prosigral tri uh, tritontimic 38, it is compared with clopidogrel. <laughs> and we found it is uh, beneficial to the population with diaptis. Whereas uh, you have to avoid in certain group of population, that is stroke, TAA patients, and patients who are above 75 years and less than 60 kg. These are the subsets we have to avoid possible. One is less than 60 kg, age above 75 years, and uh, stroke patients or TAA patients. These patients, the beneficial effects is less when compared to that of clopidogrel. So in that subset of population, either you have to go for clopidogrel or ticagla. What about uh, ticagla uh, Pegasus TV54, uh, which is the, uh, which is, uh, uh, the subset we are, whom we are talking, is a high subset, high risk patients whom after, even after 12 months, the chance of having a recurrent event is high. So these patients, whether it is compact, whether aspirin alone is sufficient, or ticagla lower dose, or ticagla 90 mg or 60 mg is safe, or uh, whether aspirin alone is sufficient. This uh, trial gave us an idea that if ticagla 60 mg is uh, uh, given for after 12 months, still 30 months, the chance of uh, reduction of CV events, MI is so among high risk population, high ischemic risk population is uh, palpable. So we can try among those patients who are high risk for recurrent ischemic events. We can continue even after 12 months with Ticaglar 60 mg BD. Uh, safety wise, there is a, a slight increase in bleeding risk of continuing Ticaglar although uh, at 60 mg BD after one year uh, when compared to aspirin alone. But uh, there is a significant reduction in uh, um, uh, reduction in CV MI score mainly contributed by the incidence of reduction in uh, MIs. So, uh, uh, as I said earlier, uh, in high subset, uh, high risk patients, we can consider Ticagla even after uh, one year, that is 60 mg or clopidogrel among the patients who have a high DAPT score uh, with less uh, lesser bleeding risk. We can go for uh, uh, DAPT therapy even after. 12 months. So, uh, uh, special populations uh, in both male and female patients, uh, du dual antiplatelet therapy after ACS is considered for 12 months. Um, uh, 
Now, whenever the bleeding risk is high, then consider six months of DNA to take the uh, and in diaptis, there is no difference. Continue odial antiplatelet therapy for 12 months in case of ACS, whether the patient is diaptic or non diaptic. So, as I said earlier, the prolonged use of DAPT among patients should be considered when, uh, uh, if there is a risk for stent thrombosis or a recurrent event is high, then consider giving DAPT therapy even after 12 months, calculating DAPT score. So, and uh, consider among patients who have peripheral arterial disease, try to consider dual antiplatelet therapy uh, even after 12 months. Uh, in uh, stable coronary artery disease patients, uh, even uh, if the patient uh, dual antiplatelet therapy should be considered among the patients who have underwent a after six months, even after six months, uh, if it is a complex PCA. So, what are the conclusion? One uh, SISU approach for DAPT duration is unlikely to fit all patients. In ACS, we know 12 months of therapy is indicated. If it is a bleeding disc is high, consider six months therapy. In case of diaptis, we know 12 months therapy is indicated. Whenever you are intervening a CBG patients with a venous graft, the chance of ISR is more. Try to go for 12 months therapy. Uh, um, always try to uh, uh, specify your dual antiplatelet therapy because our aim is not only to prevent ISR, but also to prevent future events. Non-stinted, non-target lesions are also very, very important in terms of uh, patients not coming back to us with uh, another ACS event. So, uh, stent platforms nowadays are differing and uh, uh, they have become thin stents, biodegradable stents, where uh, 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 polymer-free stents, a uh, lot of stents are available. So, all stents are not same. Each stents have their own uh, quality in terms of uh, stent. Uh, restenosis stage. So you can decide upon uh, uh, your uh, um, dual antiplatelet therapy duration depending upon the stent used, where did you use the stent, how many stents are used, and whether they are proximal stents, whether they are left pain stents, depending upon the nature of being stented, number of stents, and uh, uh, the complexity of the procedure. And uh, obviously, the interventional cardiologist know how was the result uh, post procedure. So these all determines the duration of dual antiplatelet therapy. Uh, uh, so uh, though a lot of uh, RCCT are available currently with us to decide on uh, dual antiplatelet therapy, I strongly be believe dual antiplatelet therapy duration, the choice of antiplatelet, all has to be individualized for each patient, depending upon his risk for a recurrent event and the risk of the uh, for bleeding, as well as the type of the procedure which he undergoes. Uh, thank you for your uh, patient listening. Thank you all. Thank you, Vinod. Vinod, you had given a very, very good disclosure about uh, all the drugs, the duration, everything. Now, I have a lot of reservations. The first question I asked was, which drug is going to be the first among the equals? And you came up and said that uh, you have to choose horses for courses. So you have to decide on the situation and come up with it. Now, first thing I want to ask you is, you have a patient with ACS in practical parlance. And uh, you sit, take the patient to the cath lab, probable enzyme elevation and you are taking to the cath lab, not loaded, probably taking clopidogrel. On the cath lab, when you want to do an, do an angioplasty, what would be your choice of antiplatelet drug? I usually load with uh, ticagla, 180 mg. The crush, even in the lab, I load with ticagla. Why didn't you use prasugrel? Uh, uh, I'll tell you why I asked you this question. According to your own slides, the duration of onset of action is 30 minutes with, with prasugrel and 90 minutes with ticagla. If you want immediate action, choosing prasugrel, why aren't you using it? Uh, so the comfort of the drug is also is important. The bleeding risk is slightly high, in possible. and uh, uh, our uh, we have been using uh, process, uh, ticagla in a crushed format, and uh, we have been loading in uh, uh, in the uh, uh, even in the cath lab. And uh, uh, we find uh, uh, even our stent thrombosis rates are not gone up. But actually, we can even consider prosigral in that case. One of our concerns is using prosigral when uh, among, uh, uh, among the two. But uh, previously, there is a cost constraint. The prosigral was out of patency and ticagrel was uh, in patent. So the cost was a major consideration. When the patient uh, uh, is not able to afford ticagrel, we even I, uh, I used to load them with ticagrel. But okay. uh, now, nowadays, uh, uh, processor, but was, nowadays I prefer uh, Ticagla over Prosecutor. Morley, who was stretching so long, has woken up. The moment he started discussing Prosecutor and Ticagla. I can only <laughs> Two questions here. Now, the <laughs> one is, 
there have been head to head trials and lot and different studies have shown differences if you have a stemi what do you prefer if you have a n stemi what do you prefer what about head to head trials any comment sir stemi pick up that sir n stemi if they are loaded with uh, uh clopidogrel i will do an angiogram then uh, think whether uh, i'm going to do a culprit lesion plasty or i'm going to send for a cabg then depending upon the choice then i do the patient beautiful i think you guys have been doing a lot of uh, genetic studies find out the efficacy but is it really useful there was one paper Sir, uh, what i understand is a uh, lot of patients are tending to be clopidogrel resistant uh, most of the patients are contributed by merely cell only a uh, lot of patients are uh, uh, turning out to be clopidogrel resistant but there are two types One is homozygous and heterozygous. If it is they are heterozygous, then even though they are uh, uh, clopidogrel resistance, it comes. But uh, we have been putting them on clopidogrel patients on clopidogrel are doing fine only. But uh, uh, we don't. If we found a homozygous, both alleles are positive for clopidogrel resistance, then we usually don't put them on uh, uh, clopidogrel. We switch over them to other drug. Probably if they are not affordable, initially we have been putting them for on possible. so uh, this is our strategy sir and uh, we are seeing a lot of clopidogrel resistance but how far but if you see patients uh, patient reactivity test it is going good one uh, we don't uh, see that uh, what we are seeing as a report we are, it is not translating in uh, as a stent thrombosis or acute when the patients are loaded that is what uh, i am seeing only yeah. one had something yeah see the issue is Uh, first point: genotyping or CYP two K one nine can other down the uh, thing. There won't be an echo. Uh, the genetic uh, typing is not be recommended by any body. Number one, so it is. Uh, I I I won't endorse for it. We do it. We thought we learn from it. We'll do it. One thing I have learned is that uh, it helps me to identify patients who are over reactive to ticagrelor. Some of the patients who are bleeding complications, minor, major, near fatal, all of them had more than 95% inhibition of uh, ADP mediated platelet aggregatory, less than 10%. Put them to high risk. So, given a choice today in my practice, if I do a genotyping, I mean, I mean ADP aggregatory and genotyping, I land up in two sets of patients. One is patient with clopidogrel resistant. Other one is by AD pathology matter trichocellular overreacting patients. I am caught in between actually. But one thing, the people who are clopidogrel resistant, the studies again and again have shown we could not come to a conclusion yeah. whether you are having homozygous, heterozygous. The outcome has not changed. We are yet to see an outcome-based trial where genotyping going to decide whether to give clopidogrel or not. Though we tend one. to avoid. There is there is one. there is a trial called popular genetics trial which has shown oh, yeah. you go for let let me finish popular genetics went by a prasugrel or ticagrelor versus a genetic based clopidogrel and they found out the biggest advantage in that trial is the bleed was less when you use a genetic based clopidogrel but the efficacy was as good as prasugrel or ticagrelor therefore so this is the only trial that showed it but again there was another trial we choose only clopidogrel genetic based and non genetic based and they found out it is not useful so there is a conflict of point yeah. here one of the interesting points that about uh, this particular talk that he gave us every time you have a talk on antiplatelet agents and dual antiplatelet you are always wondering which drug the company is going to favor who is going to be the sponsor interestingly this company has got all three drugs so i actually asked him which drug are you guys trying to favor he said they said that we are all three drugs any drug is good for us that's the interesting part now that brings us to the next question now interestingly clopidogrel yes there is a role for it but there is not it's the, the genetic testing is plus or minus fine for the next question of comparison of ticagrelor and prasugrel there have been three three major data the first trial was the prag prag which clearly showed in stemi there was no difference then there was another trial called the, i think the revive or the revival something in r that showed in n stemi that prasugrel was superior then the big great isar react came and said isar react was the very interesting trial actually the aim of the study was to prove that ticagrelor was superior to prasugrel and it went south it went ahead and showed that ticagrelor prasugrel was superior not only that the bleed was less now there are a lot of caveats in that study there are a lot of problems because at the end of the at discharge 
20% of the patients were not on the concerned drug and the end of the study nearly one third of the patients were not taking the drug so the trial is very skewed it's a little questionable but the point is prasugal cannot be undone prasugal is a wonderful drug and it acts very fast and based on these two trials actually what has happened is the european society of cardiology which you've been quoting throughout your study the europeans have said you don't have to load the patient in emergency once you know the anatomy you can load the patient and prasugal has taken a one class one indication the indication for your prasugal has gone higher than ticagrelor or in a patient where you are taking for a for an intervention so that that's, that's something that's happening inside so you can think about it there the next point that you have made is about the duration of antiplatelet i think most of us will agree that 12 months of dual antiplatelet therapy is required so when do you select the dual antiplatelet therapy i think the european society of cardiology is what you are quoting has given one specific high risk and moderate risk sub group of patients the high risk patients are those with multi vessel disease and recurrent mi chronic and, huh? and diabetes so you have any one of these four with the multi vessel disease it's a high risk group those are the patients if they don't have a high bleeding risk they are going to clearly benefit from dual antiplatelet therapy or dual anti thrombotic therapy as you beautifully put in dr swagatachan clearly said so it's going to be multi vessel disease recurrent mi pad diabetes or ckd if you have one of these four you can go in for a long term dual anti thrombotic therapy where rivaroxaban comes in so which one to choose that is where the next question comes in the safety of the drug if you look at the safety of the drug the number needed to treat and the number needed to harm comes into the picture the number needed to treat in case of uh, in the in the case of rivaroxaban was 84 and the number needed to harm was 81 we think that the bleed was high but most of the bleeds were not fatal bleeds the major and minor bleeds were high but non fatal bleeds that is one the second point is the next drug that comes is pegasus pegasus number needed to treat was 77 with an 84 of number needed to harm it's fairly safe this is fairly safe the concept of pegasus is exactly what this indication for a high vessel from uh, high risk patients are but which is the safest drug the safest two drugs based on the dapt and the other trials that you have been quoting have been clopidogrel and prasugrel the number needed to treat was 63 number needed to harm was 105 so if you have a patient with a slightly higher risk of bleeding clopidogrel is going to be the drug of choice so you have to decide on the choice but if you want the best efficacy probably you're not going to look at that you're going to be probably looking at high risk patients like heart failure and diabetes peripheral arterial disease but in this one sub group the peripheral arterial disease sub group where rivaroxaban has been fantastic so if you have a multi vessel or polyvascular disease the the, uh, the rivaroxaban is probably going to be the drug of choice so i think the horses of course's concept is a lot more complicated than what we think it is you just have to select your patient choose carefully and go ahead only go ahead Shubhakarasham sir, can we uh, what, take one or two questions and move after Morali's comment? After Morali's comment, yeah. Oh, thanks for uh, confusing <laughs> very clearly. <laughs> the way they says as the quarter as we are coming to that at the end, we uh, we know just mention about twilight trial. Twilight same sub group. What you are saying? It is not even enough after three months. Like it is not enough. They have shown. We are looking at it. Well, the problem is, I tell you, before we close, the problem is we are looking at numbers, we are looking at data, and we are looking at the risk-benefit ratio only to go up and down, up and down. It is not benefit alone, not risk alone. So if a benefit comes on, the bleeding in the stream is almost same in most of the trials. Number one, number two, I always tell all my in every talk, platelet activity is only one component of acute coronary syndrome, and Platelet inhibition never makes the entire platelet of the body dysfunctional. We never cause that. Number three, platelet in atherosclerosis is three factors: adhesion, ag aggregation, and activation. Unfortunately, the first point, adhesion, we don't have any drug to inhibit. So what we are saying is, we want to give trials after trials. Industry comes in, data pours in, but the fundamental pathophysiology we haven't addressed fully. We may not be able to address fully also. we need platelet we need clotting also that is the problem is so we can keep on talking on this one or the other but the fact is a nascent condition should look into it i have a patient who are ticagrelor high bleeding risk clopidogrel not all working and i can't give prasugrel after 12 months no guideline tell uh, suggest me that i don't know what to do but let me continue prasugrel so these are the confusions so it more and more complicated i think by trying to say you are confused clearly i am adding to the confusion much more clearly thank you <laughs> 
one, one point to that, that is uh, the ticagrelor 60 milligram. In fact, one of the interesting things that he mentioned was that beyond one year, it might be sensible to stop the aspirin and continue only a P2Y12 inhibitor. That is also sensible. Because there have been a few trials which have actually shown that you can have a stenting with just prasugrel. The ACID trial came where they never used aspirin in a stable coronary artery disease with an elective angioplasty. They just gave ticagrelor and nothing happened. Patients were as good as dual antiplatelet therapy. So there is a lot of questions. The aspirin came first, so it is still sticking on. We may have, maybe next year if we have this discussion, we may not have aspirin at all. So that, that's, that like you are adding more confusion, I'm adding some more confusion. There's one question in the chat box. I just asked that to Vinod. It says that onset of loading dose effect is the same as 30 minutes for prasugrel and ticagrelor. Your comment on that? Sir, 30 minutes or 90 minutes actually. But they say in ticagrelor, if you crush and give, the yeah. action might be faster. So it is always nowadays post uh, Now what we are doing is we crush the drug and give it uh, to the patient. So the, they say the action becomes 30 minutes or 45 minutes. But uh, the initial metabolism is only 90 minutes. I think, I think that's, that's good. Murli, you want to give a summary? We can go ahead. Yeah, I think, I think uh, very, very nice uh, thing. Beautiful discussion. Well summed up by Vinod also. Plan is use your drug based on the patient. Use, remember to use uh, precise DAP score and DAP score whenever possible. You will be you will be right at least ethically and legally, but apply your mind before deciding. And rivaroxaban is emerging as a very good combination for dual pathway diffusion therapy. Time will come to establish it in the in maybe the next few years. I think we can move close down because the next session is waiting. We are all yes. here. We can participate in that session. I think we are running short of time. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Murli. Uh, uh, Vinod Kumar and uh, thanks, Prabhakar, for wonderfully having summed it up and. Uh, Whenever there is a meeting on BAPT, we used to wonder why again on BAPT. Today, it's very clear that any number of meetings will only add to clarity and both confusion. Clarity and confusion, so that we'll continue to learn more. The next person who is going to chair the next session is the apt person who is an, uh, an intensive uh, practitioner of lipidology and also uh, peripheral vascular disease. Uh, Dr. Manu Verma from Ernakulam and uh, being a lipidologist is the right person to take up this topic and discuss with uh, all of us how low is too low because every day there is an emerging uh, uh, LDL level 160, 130, 100, 70, 50 or less than 50. So today by the end of uh, the, uh, these lectures I think we will be able to know which is the best level at which we can keep and what is the best drug that can be used or what are the drugs that can be combined. And uh, Manuama has got the greatest experience as a lipidologist and uh, peripheral vascular intervention. And therefore, you'll be able to add a few points. If uh, they've got a peripheral vascular disease, is there any newer drug like uh, PCSK9, which can be used for some time also? And uh, Dr. Manuama, please. No, you have to unmute, Mano. Yeah. Hello, good evening, dear friends. Uh, from medical trial to proving to me 22 trials, whether it is an acute coronary syndrome or a chronic coronary syndrome, the statins became the cornerstone in the management of coronary artery disease. And high intensity statin is the tune of the day. Definitely, if you look at the statin trials, all the clinic, even though evidences are there, all the clinical benefit, benefit translated only after one year of therapy. So prolonged duration of the therapy is also important. We have multiple agents, which is added therapy to the statins to reduce the numbers. But whether they have independently reduced the cardiovascular events, or only a symbiotic benefit. That is one thing which we really have to find out from the, by elucidating the different trials. And now we have got new molecules from Odyssey trials we, and Fourier trials. I showed Dagurokumab as well as Rivaloktimab. And uh, similarly, Escitamab is also there. And the Reduce trial has showed a newer molecule like isopentyl ether. So 
different molecules are there in the treatment armamentorium. To discuss about these issues, we have a wonderful moderator who is Dr. Shiva George. She's a respected senior interventional cardiologist at Jubilee Memorial Hospital to Random. She's an alumni of Government Medical College. But what I would like to talk about is she's equally skilled in negotiating a catheter in the cath lab, as well as a strings of the vena. Painting different pictures on the canvas also trained a classical dancer. And above all, an excellent poet who has penned down many poetries in Malayalam as well as in English. Published a book way back in 2007-2008, am I right? I don't know. The Diagony of Innocence. We, Kerala CSA, are very fortunate to have her along with us amongst and very proud of her. And definitely, she's an apt person to talk about or to moderate the session. And uh, she will introduce the next speaker, Dr. Sujay Ranga. Welcome you, madam. Madam, you have to unmute. Yeah. Good evening, everybody. Thank you, Dr. Manu Varma, for those beautiful words. Okay, uh, I think we are running short of time. So uh, we have to start the second session. The first session was so interesting and uh, uh, you know very vivid. We had a lot of uh, new knowledge thrown by the speaker and the moderator and chairperson. So now we have another very interesting topic. Uh, we know that um, uh, you know uh, all patients who have had an acute coronary syndrome do have a high risk for subsequent events. So how to prevent these events is a real issue and a challenging issue. And we know that uh, statins will help in preventing uh, subsequent events. But uh, is it because of the lowering of LDL alone that statins do this effect or because of its pleiotropic actions? Uh, we have to know. Also, how long uh, we have to bring down the LDL cholesterol to achieve clinical benefit? This has always been a real doubtful issue. So uh, earlier it was, uh, our aim was to keep it below 100 for a patient who have had an acute coronary event. But later it came down to 70. Now uh, data say we can go down further, but is it safe to keep such low values for long-term in view of other systemic involvement like uh, dementia, neurological problems? So we have to listen to uh, um, this next session to learn how low we can bring down our LDL cholesterol. For that, we have a very excellent speaker, Dr. Sujay Renga. He is a senior interventional cardiologist from NS Memorial Institute of Medical Sciences, Pallam. And he is a chief interventional cardiologist. He was a chief interventional cardiologist at Bishop Ben Sigar Hospital, Pallam. He was a consultant interventional cardiologist at Baby Memorial Hospital, uh, Calicut. He wo worked as assistant professor in cardiology at Vandal Medical College. He has been a consultant interventional cardiologist at uh, Medical College uh, Pariyaram. And then uh, I, I understand that he uh, has uh, good hands-on experience uh, in treating in, um, not only interventional cardiology, but also in electrophysiology. He has had his training under Dr. Peter Thomas. And also he has a, a, a diploma, a postgraduate diploma uh, for um, medical ethics or something from the Symbiosis University, Pune. He has his DM from a, a prestigious PGI Chandigarh. And um, above all, now I know him as a good uh, uh, propagator of uh, physical fitness in our CSI group. So I welcome Dr. Sudhiranga to this meeting. And Sudhiranga, the floor is yours. Give us a, uh, a deliver your lecture now. Uh, <clears throat> uh, good evening, uh, distinguished chairperson, moderators. Uh, we are friends from across uh, the state and uh, probably in neighboring states also. Uh, we are all fighting an invisible enemy, and it is gladdening to see the smiling faces of our colleagues uh, from the state as well as from our neighboring state. And it was uh, exciting to listen to uh, the talk on dual antiplatelet therapy. So it is my talk which is standing. Uh, in, in the way between a beautiful dinner, which has been uh, properly been uh, delivered to all of our houses. 
and so i'll make it very uh, uh, crisp and short as possible so i'll just discuss three important points on uh, uh, what is the evidence for low ldl levels what is the need to achieve low ldl levels as uh, uh, shubham madam told is there an issue with achieving such going so low on ldl levels and what do the guidelines say uh, we'll, i'll start with the clinical scenario this is a patient a 50 year old male diabetic hypertensive he had acute anterior wall mi in 2019 underwent a uh, primary pca to lad and he was on dual antiplatelet but again had a recurrence uh, he had inferior wall mi in 2021 during the covid times so he was initially thrombolyzed and then later taken up for elective coronary angiogram and pca elective was done to the right coronary artery he is on dual antiplatelet beta blocker ac meters and he is on atorvastatin 40 mg and his uh, lipid profile showed a total cholesterol of 110 an ldl of 69 and hdl of 30 and a triglyceride of 200 so he is on uh, the optimal dose of uh, statin therapy as per the 2013 accah lipid guidelines long time back uh, which actually said that you should give statins to only four group of patients one patients who had another sclerotic cardiovascular disease two people with an ldl cholesterol of more than 190 three diabetes in the age group of 40 to 75 years and four people who have a high risk of uh, Uh, future other sclerotic cardiovascular disease events and uh, it, the, the epidemiological studies from 1950s to 80s showed that there is a close link almost linear relationship between the cholesterol level and the incidence of other sclerotic cardiovascular disease and the subsequent statin trials from the 1980s to 2000s showed that a decrease in uh, cholesterol level with the use of statins can bring down the uh, the other sclerotic cardiovascular disease events and we all know that the ldl is the uh, is involved in every stage of atherosclerotic uh, plaque formation right from the endothelial dysfunction to formation of fatty streak to formation of the vulnerable plaque the plaque rupture thrombosis and uh, production of both uh, the stable as well as unstable coronary syndrome so ldl is the key culprit there and uh, studies have shown that uh, ldl is a major contributor to the cardiovascular disease And the various secondary prevention trials showed that there is almost a linear relationship between LDL cholesterol levels as well as, as the and the cardiovascular events. And uh, intravascular ultrasound studies have shown that uh, LDL cholesterol level is closely linked to atherosclerosis progression in coronary arteries. And that's why the concept that uh, the lower the LDL, the better, the the lesser the relative risk of coronary heart disease. and we have a, we have a lot of drugs which can produce decrease in ldl cholesterol levels and the the primary drugs are of course the statins uh, which can be used as a low intensity moderate intensity or a high intensity statin a high, high intensity statin is one which produces a decrease in ldl levels by more than 50 percentage and you have non statin drugs uh, which have shown evidence to reduce cardiovascular events that is the the acetamide which can produce a 20 percent decrease in ldl cholesterol level and the pcsk9 inhibitors which can produce the At the highest, the maximum sixty percent decrease in the LDL cholesterol levels, and when we combine these drugs, so if we combine statin with an acetamide, we can get a sixty-five percent decrease in LDL cholesterol level, and to a maximum of eighty-five percent if we combine all the three statin, acetamide, and PCSK9. So we have potent drugs which can uh, reduce the LDL cholesterol level to whatever level we want. And uh, the the cholesterol uh, treatment trial is collaboration uh, has shown that. Uh, the meta analysis shown that uh, compared to controls moderate intensity statin can produce a 21 percentage relative risk reduction per millimole per liter decrease in ldl cholesterol level and if you give high intensity statins and reduce the ldl cholesterol level to further lower than 70 mg per deciliter that produces a 16 percentage additional relative risk reduction for every 0.5 millimole per liter decrease in ldl cholesterol level so if you combine these two together There is almost 33 percent relative risk reduction for every 1.5 millimole per liter decrease in LDL cholesterol levels. So, a 2 to 3 millimole millimole per liter LDL cholesterol level can produce a 50 percent decrease in other sclerotic cardiovascular disease events. If you look at the different trials of uh, uh, statins, uh, the TNT Jupiter, the Pruvit trial, all of them showed that the lower the LDL cholesterol level, lesser is the major cardiovascular event, be it in secondary prevention. or in primary prevention trials and uh, uh, this meta analysis of statin trial showed that the lowest the pa patients in the lowest uh, category of statins if you look at the graph the patients who have an ldl cholesterol of less than 50 and compare the pa compared to patients who have an ldl cholesterol level between 50 to 75 those with less than 50 have a significantly lower risk compared to the patients in the, in the in the category of 50 to 75 
a milligram per deciliter. So the lowest quartile of uh, LDL cholesterol level produces the maximum decrease in major adverse cardiac events. But despite these uh, achievements in reduction LDL cholesterol level, there still remains a residual cardiovascular risk even with uh, higher intensity statin therapy. So higher intensity hydrostatin therapy produces a significantly lower LDL cholesterol than modern statin therapy. It produces a decrease in cardiovascular event, but even in such patient, there is still remains a residual cardiovascular disease risk and research is on to further uh, target this residual group. And that's why we look at further lowering of the LDL cholesterol level and we look at non-statin strategies. From the IMPROVE trial, we found that uh, if you add acetamide to uh, statins, there is an additional LDL cholesterol reduction of almost 20 percentage, with, uh, which uh, translates to a 6 percentage decrease in cardiovascular events. And we have the uh, PCSK9 inhibitor trials, uh, the four-year trial with uh, Evolocumab, uh, compared to placebo, Evolocumab produced almost 60 percent decrease in LDL cholesterol levels. There is a significant decrease in primary composite endpoints of cardiovascular death, MI, stroke, hospital admissions, TAA, alcohol revascularization, as well as the key secondary endpoints of CV death, MI, or stroke. And if you look at the different subgroups, the patients who achieved an LD cholesterol level of less than 10 had a hazard ratio of 0.69 compared to those with a LD cholesterol level of between 70 to 99. So there is almost a linear relationship between the uh, adverse cardiac events and the uh, LD cholesterol level achieved. And uh, uh, the intravascular uh, uh, studies in uh, GLAGO trial uh, on Evolocumab showed that patients who uh, received a combination of statin with Evolocumab had a significant lesser percentage atheroma volume, and they produce lesser progression and more regression of the atherosclerotic plaque in the coronary arteries. So a combination of statin with PCSK9 produces significantly more regression of atherosclerosis. Uh, so a meta-analysis was done on uh, non-statin trials, including improve it, reveal, and four-year trial of more than 50,000 patients. And uh, the, the control arm had patients who had an LD cholesterol level between 60 to 70. A total of now around 10,000 major vascular events occurred, and they showed that uh, the non-statin therapy further lowered LDL cholesterol level by 0.3 to 1.2. That is around, around uh, 10 to uh, 45 milligram per deciliter. And so a, a decrease in LDL cholesterol level from 60 to 70 by around 40 produced additional decrease in major vascular events. So there is a, so the, the residual risk can be uh, tackled by adding the newer non-statin uh, drugs. Uh, so there's a consistent relative risk reduction in major vascular events for further reduction in LDL cholesterol in a patient population starting as low as a mean of 63 milligram per deciliter to achieving a level of around 20 milligram per deciliter. So if you go really low, then the vascular events also come down. But is there an issue? No, we have uh, we are born with an LDL cholesterol of between 30 to 40 milligram per deciliter. Patients with hypobetal lipoproteinemia and abetal lipoproteinemia have very low cholesterol levels. The concerns are uh, whether it affects the metabolic functions which are reliant upon cholesterol, such as gonadal hormones or adrenal function, uh, whether it affects transport of fat soluble vitamins, uh, the, our neurons uh, have uh, cholesterol as the envelope, and so does it affect neuronal transmission? Does it lead to cognitive uh, impairment? Uh, there have been some uh, post market reports of uh, statin producing some ill defined memory impairment, which are reversible upon statin discontinuation. There are some observed studies which have described the cognitive effects. Uh, PCSK9 trials have shown that uh, there may be some neurocognitive effect, although uh, it is not statically significant. And that's why FDA has given a box warning, uh, warning both the patients as well as the uh, treating physicians about the possibility of memory loss and confusion, which have been reported with the tools, and it has advised the patients and clinicians to be aware of this possible side effect. And then we have some Mendelian randomization studies done in patients with uh, low LDL cholesterol, PCSK9, HMG, uh, GCR, uh, genetic variation, and the risk of uh, neurological disease. And they found that there is some increase in Parkinson's disease in patients in the lowest quartiles of LDL cholesterol levels. So does this translate into drug-induced decrease in LDL cholesterol level was the concern. But uh, this was a, a, a meta-analysis of randomized control trial. which specifically looked at uh, whether statins impair cognition, and they found that compared to placebo, there is no significant impairment of cognition in patients uh, who are put on statins. And uh, Ebingos was a study which specifically looked at uh, patients on Evolocumab, whether it affects neurocognitive functions. It looked at uh, various functions like spatial work, uh, working memory, uh, paired associated learning, and various tools, and found that uh, when, when you combine with placebo, uh, 
the uh, ebulafema did not produce any significant worsening of the neurocognitive function and this was uh, mirrored in other meta analysis also which uh, showed that the neurocognitive dysfunction although numerically more uh, in patients on fcsk9 inhibitors was not statistically significantly different and uh, th there is a pool data from randomized control trials with aldrocumab which again looked at various uh, side effects like uh, neurocognitive events drug induced diabetes mellitus ophthalmological events cataract hepatic disorders and it found that cataracts are statistically uh, significantly more in patients who have an ld cholesterol of less than 25 compared to patients with a more than ld uh, uh, compared to those with an ld of more than 25 but all other side effects like neurological events neurocognitive disorders or and diabetes mellitus was not significantly different in those with an ld cholesterol of less than 25 versus more than 25 so no significant worsening of neurocognitive impairment there and they also looked at the uh, levels of uh, fat soluble uh, vitamins the vitamin a d e k and found that the vitamin levels were overall uh, similar in patients with the uh, ld cholesterol level less than 25 or and even with in patients who had an ld cholesterol of less than 15 so there is no significant impairment of the uh, metabolism of the fat soluble vitamins so that takes away that probably takes away the confusion but then these are not uh, long term data we don't have very long term data of, on pcs can inhibitors as we, as we have established but whatever is available is promising and says that there is no significant neurocognitive impairment even with extremely low levels of ldl that we achieve with these drugs and uh, so the accha uh, updated the guidelines in 2018 and now they say that in patients with clinical atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease patients can be categorized into very high risk and the not very high risk in patients who are very high risk you you give them a high intensity straight away give them high intensity or maximum tolerable dose of statins and if the ldl cholesterol level remains more than 70 then you can consider adding an acetamide and if still the ldl is more than 70 you can consider adding a pcsk9 inhibitor so the ldl levels that that is the only ldl level that the accah guideline talk about is uh, that it should be less than 70 and if it is not mainly less than 70 you add the non statin drugs and in primary prevention you should uh, uh, focus on patients who have an ldl of more than 190 same as the early guidelines patients people with type 2 diabetes mellitus you start on moderate intensity statin and patients with atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease and in uh, 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 and in patients who are more than uh, who, who don't who do not have either other atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease family hyperlipidemia or diabetes you uh, divide them depending upon the the framing and risk score and people with a high risk can intermediate risk score can have a statin up front the uh, 2019 esc guidelines are more clear uh, uh, in terms of the ldl levels they divide the patient into four different groups a low risk group a moderate risk group high risk group and very high risk group depending upon a scoring system and if the, all the patient with atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease are in the in the very high risk group people with a risk score of more than 10 percentage are in the very high risk group those with the with a family history of atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease with another major risk factors people with an egfr of less than 30 diabetes with uh, endocrine damage and more than or equal to three major risk factors all of them fall in the very high risk group and in the very high risk group the target ldl level should be less than 55 mg per deciliter so less than 55 mg per deciliter in patients with high risk group it should be less than 70 in moderate risk group it should be less than 100 so the target that in other sclerotic cardiovascular disease the target the esc guideline recommend is a level of less than 55 mg per deciliter and if for other sclerotic cardiovascular disease patients who experiences a second vascular event within 2 years that is similar to the patient in our clinical scenario where a patient had a recurrent interval mi within 2 years in such patients an ldl cholesterol goal of less than 40 may be considered so you can you can go up to even less than 40 in patients who are in the the highest extremely high risk group who had recurrent cardiovascular frequent recurrent cardiovascular events and uh, we have the latest guidelines would be the 2021 canadian cardiovascular society guidelines which uh, uh, similarly categorizes the patients into low risk intermediate risk and high risk depending upon the framing of risk score more than 20% risk means you are in the high risk group and uh, patients in the high risk group uh, you initiate the patient on statin treatment and if if we are not achieving the ldl cholesterol uh, levels uh, uh, of less than 2 millimol per liter that is less than around uh, uh, 85 mil, uh, milligram per deciliter you can add an acetamide by the second line agent or uh, they also say bilateral sequestrants as an alternative and in patient with atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease uh, it is always uh, patients are started on uh, high intensity statin therapy 
and uh, if the ldl cholesterol remains more than 70 then you can consider adding acetamide uh, followed by pcsk9 inhibitors and the, the, these guidelines also talk about triglyceride levels and the triglyceride levels are more than uh, 150 to 500 they consider they, they recommend to consider adding hypothyroidism 2 grams twice daily so uh, the the depending on based on the current uh, uh, evidence the guidelines have uh, been modified to newer ldl target levels so to conclude uh, we are born with an ld cholesterol level of uh, uh, 30 to 40 milligram per deciliter under gatherers at the low ld cholesterol level with very low prevalence of cad extreme risk group is an additional uh, asfd risk category indicating greater atheroma and greater mace and these uh, patients need more aggressive ldl cholesterol reduction extremely low levels of ldl can be achieved with newer drugs and should be considered as an option in this extremely high risk group maximum total dose of statins with or without acetamide adequate lifestyle interventions and treatment of all modifiable risk factors must be looked into carefully prior to addition of newer much costlier drugs like pcsk9 inhibitors and identification of the highest risk group would benefit from maximally with efficient drug therapy is probably the most important uh, uh, key that we should be looking at but however the final decision should always follow a detailed discussion between the patient and the treatment physician thank you very much for your uh, patient listening and i hope that uh, all of us uh, stay safe uh, from the pandemic thank you uh, thank you so dr sujeranga for the beautiful disclosure uh, are you in practice trying to achieve this low levels of less than 50 uh, <laughs> in your practice as an interventional cardiologist uh, and how low uh, would you go and do you think patients uh, accept these low levels because our um, malu population are well known to google all these things and and they you know they have a lot of quotations than us though it is not from the scientific world yeah probably so, madam our patients probably listen more to the pharmacist from where they get the drug so usually the pharmacy tell them that your LDL cholesterol is too low and your doctor has given you an overdose of medicine and you should cut down on, on your tablets. So my, our, our practice would be in patients with an acute coronary syndrome, at least in the first one month, we try to give them the maximum dollar dose of drug. And you look at the LDL levels after one month and then uh, uh, then uh, treat them according to what is their LDL and how much LDL reduction have they achieved. Now, it is easy to talk about guidelines, but it's difficult to practice uh, 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 in our routine uh, uh, daily practice. Uh, but in, in patients who have uh, extremely uh, recurrent uh, events, very frequent recurrent events, I think we try to go really low. But uh, combining an, uh, the need to combine nesetimai with atrocytin is not very frequent. And we usually achieve low LDA levels even with an atrocytin of 80 milligram or atrocytin of 40 milligram. Correct. Mm -hmm. Ma'am, can I make a comment, Dr. Shiba? Sure, 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 Dr. Prabhagar. Hi, it's nice to see you. Time. I think yeah. probably the first time we are meeting. Inside India. <laughs> correct, correct. <laughs> okay. uh, a couple of things. Uh, you haven't spoken about the lipid association of India guidelines. I'm one of the co-authors ah. for that. Yeah, I'm sorry about it. As okay. early as 2016, we have recommended an LDL cholesterol of uh, 50. And in 2020, we came up with a guideline for the very high risk group for 30 milligrams LDL cholesterol. One of the biggest reasons was the GLAGO trial, which you quoted correctly. But there's another slide on that, which clearly shows when the mean level of Lag out trial is actually 30 milligrams. So when you achieve 30 milligrams, you actually have reversal of atherosclerosis. That's one of the very important reasons. Uh, there are a lot of other interesting facts about uh, cholesterol. One is you say that you want to reduce your LDL, your uh, uh, statin therapy after one month of therapy. No, you cannot do that. We started saying lower the better. Now we are saying lowest is the best. Lowest is the best. It holds good. Now, there is one particular Korean trial which has clearly stated that post-PCI, if you start giving a high-intensity statin for the same level of LDL cholesterol compared to a high-intensity statin or a non-high-intensity statin, the incidence of MACE is higher if you don't give a non-high-intensity statin. The reason is the plaque stabilization does not happen with a non-high-intensity statin. So don't reduce the statin. If the patient tolerates it, why are you going after numbers? Now, Dr. Shiba had a very, very valid point which said that our Malu population Googles. My population also Googles. Everybody Googles nowadays. Who doesn't Google? So the answer is, the moment you start the patient on a high-intensity statin, tell them their target is less than 50 milligrams of LDL cholesterol. Once you tell them, they know, and tell them clearly that your lab values are all humbug because the biggest caveat 
is the lab reference value, which says the ATP3 guideline, which is 2002. That is the biggest problem in treatment of LDL cholesterol. So you have to tell them, this is your target. That is for normal people. That helps you a lot. So I think that you have to go. And safety of LDL cholesterol is very, very important. The long-term safety of LDL cholesterol less than 30 has been proven. There is a separate article in ACC in Jack that came up about uh, maybe about six months ago. It's just clearly proven it, but clearly states less than 15 in the long term is not proven. So try to keep it for the high intensity patient between 15 and 30. Another interesting point, you mentioned the European Society of Cardiology guidelines, which said that for a recurrent MI, you go for a 40 milligrams per cent. Now this 40 milligrams per cent, Dr. Iyengar, who is the chairperson of the Lipidus of India, wrote to the European Society of Cardiology and asked them, how did you land up with this 40 milligram per cent? They did not have an answer to it. Now, if you ask me, how did he land up with a 30 milligram? The Glago gives you the answer. So once you have 55, you're not sure, land up at 30. And who are the persons who are going to benefit from 30? Those with polyvascular disease. They have multiple vascular events. Like the Rivaroxaban group, this is the statin that is very, very important. The second subset is the diabetic subset. The diabetic and polyvascular disease, they benefit a lot from high intensity statin. You can bring it down to 30. I don't have the slide, but... Uh, there is, a, there is a Lipid System India guideline that was published in uh, November or December, JAPI special issue, which shows the full guideline wherein there is an extreme risk category A and B. The category B, you try to bring down the LDL cholesterol to 30 milligrams per cent. Hi, uh, good evening, everybody. Can I add a point, sir? Yeah, sure, sir. Uh, see, um, uh, uh, Sujay, your uh, talk was extremely enlightening. Uh, uh, my uh, recommendation is that you talk. Uh, little bit uh, to the patient. And usually they will listen to whatever the Google says or the uh, laboratory person says. Today morning itself, I had a patient who had a, an LDL value of 42. Three months back, his LDL was uh, 38. He had an antivalum, a young chap, 37, one year. He's doing extremely fine. So uh, I was just telling that if your LDL does come now, uh, there is an Indian recommendation that uh, uh, probably keeping below 40 is okay. And you have to keep on keeping it below 40. Then only you are, uh, uh, you know, the, the um, bad cholesterol which has been uh, laid in your blood vessels dissolve off. This is the way that I talk to them. And most of them uh, listen to me. I, can I add something? No, this is not about um, uh, lip, uh, lowering the LDL. But actually speaking, the acute coronary syndrome or the pathophysiology of acute coronary syndrome is not essentially the, we know it's not essentially the lipids. It is uh, actually a triad of inflammation, insulin resistance, and oxidative stress. So keeping LDL cholesterol to the bare minimum alone will not solve the issue. That's, uh, that's what I always uh, feel. So there should be something which can, uh, you know, really suppress the inflammation and uh, insulin resistance. All of us, uh, majority of the South Asian population have insulin resistance. So how to target insulin resistance, how to target inflammation, how to target the oxidative stress. Probably oxidative stress is taken care of partly by the statins because of their pleiotrophic effect. But um, uh, prevention of uh, ACS uh, maize um, does not depend on lowering LDL cholesterol alone. That's always uh, that what I have felt because I've kept LDL cholesterol low in many patients. Still, they have come back with um, heart attacks. Still, they have come back with even hemorrhagic stroke I have seen, um, uh, ischemic strokes I have seen. So we do not have a total answer whether everything is uh, you know based on the LDL cholesterol alone. So it is uh, some, something more beyond that. So we have to probably target the three trios which are responsible for the renal vascular uh, disease. Uh, not simply, uh, I think sometimes I feel, uh, you know, yeah, doctor population are wrongly targeting the LDL. I'm sorry to say in this platform. Because uh, <laughs> the many of our patients with uh, MI, we do not see very high LDL levels, you know. Beautiful okay. point. Beautiful point. I'll just make a comment on that. Now, it's clearly proven that the LDL cholesterol has been traditionally studied, and that is the reason we keep talking about LDL. One month ago, there was a beautiful paper come, uh, from, the, uh, from the Copenhagen group, from that study. They studied and said, 
non hdl cholesterol and apolipoprotein b are much superior targets so non hdl cholesterol is otherwise called as poor man's apolipoprotein b because it you have to assay it separately so you not only take care of the ldl cholesterol but there is something called the remnant cholesterol which is the cholesterol content of the triglycerides lipoprotein little a and the other factors so don't go after ldl cholesterol if you look at all those patients they will have a non hdl cholesterol that's high routinely in my clinical practice i do apolipoprotein bp b for all secondary prevention patients because once you have achieved ldl cholesterol if the apolipoprotein b is not achieved target it's called a discordant factor if it is discordant factor then they are high risk they are the patients who are more prone for heart disease concordance is when both are low both the ldl is low apolipoprotein b is low it is fine you have a discordance sometimes it's discordant low risk where the apo b is low and the ldl can be low because apo b is the particle that binds to the vessel wall and creates a problem now if you want me to confuse you a little more like burli says i can give you one more factor burli shall i yeah so <laughs> one way you are treating those patients i'm wondering those patients dr dr mangal anandan it's a what excellent question now what you have to do is you have to intensify the statin because they are the patients who are more prone for coronary artery disease now i have a data of about uh, nearly 2000 patients on apolipoprotein b and this thing and i have found out this discordant pattern and concordant pattern the patients who do the best are those who actually achieve an apo b value which is less than ldl cholesterol oh, very rare but it does happen now i am a big big user of high intensity statin i use 40 mg of rosuvastatin extensively the lowest ldl i have in my clinical practice is 19 mg they are all fine yeah pcs can yeah. i hardly use much now if you want me to confuse you a little more there's something like more interesting like the small dense ldl and the large dense ldl which is actually not the small dense ldl and the large dense ldl if you see it more carefully there are two types of ldl cholesterol rich ldl and cholesterol depleted ldl okay now the cholesterol depleted ldl and the cholesterol rich ldl happen work differently the cholesterol rich ldl gets into the vessel wall yeah. it deposits the cholesterol and comes out so that increases the plaque volume and the atheroma increases the cholesterol depleted ldl which we commonly know as the small dense ldl goes inside the vessel wall and does not come out so what it does is it is going to stay inside the vessel wall promote inflammation and it produces a plaque rupture and produces an acs so both are equally dangerous so what is the common factor in both both have apolipoprotein b so both are dangerous so go after apolipoprotein b so the Please. final message is very simple ldl cholesterol target which dr sujay has been talking about we must change the topic next time and say look at targets of apolipoprotein b yeah uh, prabhakar your apolipoprotein b both 48 and 100 no which one you are going to measure both b 48 and b 100 yeah when you look at wait, practically when you look at apolipoprotein b it comes most but most of it is b 100 b 48 is hardly anything see it is very easy to understand apolipoprotein b there is one apolipoprotein b per cholesterol molecule cholesterol lipoprotein so you can have a small amount of uh, large ldl each will have one one apolipoprotein b and several small ldl all will have each one one apolipoprotein b and when you measure lipo apolipoprotein b you are going to measure not only ldl but also on idl and if it is going to add chiro microns and uh, we will also if it is going to encompass b48 but we know apolipoprotein b itself is a causative agent for atherosclerosis that is a discordance where you get the ldl level maybe more than the apolipoprotein b because that is a group where you have suppressed other apolipoprotein b carrying uh, lipid subgroups like idl ldl everything so given a choice apolipoprotein b will be a better measure than ldl no doubt at all and interesting as madam said uh, it, it has been again again and told maybe a percentage increase you make the entire world you lipidemic i use the word you lipidemic the entire human race you are going to reduce the coronary artery disease only by 33 to 40% only man so absolutely right that is interesting so if people think lipid is completely a only thing right it's not like anaphylis uh, mosquito and uh, malaria it is not like you kill ldl you are going to kill cad that is a totally wrong notion ldl is very useful but interesting what i learned in the last two decades is a yeah, risk factor like ldl hypertension diabetes everything slowly ldl is becoming a causative agent 
but not only agent madam you are absolutely right so our physician should go with the idea treat elderly but treat the patient there are many other respectors which can cause coronary artery disease acute coronary syndrome i agree totally agree with you morley it's a multiple coronary disease uh, and this is only one point interrupt you dr manu sir please see uh, just reduction of ldl cholesterol is not enough because we had many other agents also but we couldn't find any translating to any significant benefit even if you are talking about the evolocumab or aliloc alirocumab also they are done on the top of the intensities to more high intensity statin statins so in fact the ldl reduction and uh, along with statin probably what we could get is the ancillary property of the statin also again jupiter trial showed the reduction of the high sensitive c reactive property whereas in the case if you use an ivalocumab or alirocumab there is no significant reduction of the high sensitive c reactive protein which was again uh, demonstrated in the evopac trial so we do not have in fact a particular molecule if you take other than statins everything to along with statin only which is superior or you can say about this will reduce the uh, more effect so along with statins by reducing we are getting the benefit in fact we really don't know are we attacking the stat ldl is the main culprit or not whatever we mentioned regarding the inflammation and lipoprotein a above 15 mg is found to be uh, atherogenic and we can see velocumab and alirocumab decreases the lipoprotein a whereas statin do not so in fact we need more data and more trials as well as the individual trials other than the if you want to take it the evolocumab alone its effective is better than that of the statins so without statins we need to study uh, different there is some data to that effect sir there is some data to that effect to say and there are two things there one is that the lp little a has been found to be independently predictive of Absolutely. coronary artery disease even in the pcsk9 trials the separate papers which have proven that part that is that is proven and the second point about uh, any other drugs there are two drugs that reduce the uh, the lipoprotein a lipoprotein a is an exclusively indian compound it is supposed to be the dangerous cholesterol so what it, it uh, or the ugly cholesterol so what it can be brought down by one this and two is the um, the hdl elevating drug. what is it called the even it it's a nicotinic acid nicotinic acid nicotinic acid, acid, nicotinic acid, acid, acid has been proven to be useless sir the hps yeah, it is decreases the lipoprotein a no no sir the other other thing that works is the acetrap uh, also brings down the lp little a by 30% so these are the two drugs the other interesting fact that we are all not discussed about today we are speaking only about ldl is that hdl cholesterol is no longer considered important because what we measure as hdl cholesterol in clinical practice is the content of hdl cholesterol it's not the functionality of hdl cholesterol yeah but oh, yeah. but in epidemiological studies for a given person it has been proven to be inversely proportional to the incidence of coronary artery disease that is there but reducing H radio increasing hdl has not been proven to be useful in any of the anacitrapib or the uh, uh, trapib trials so that is something that we have to be looking at in future and talking about it see that that is, that is very obvious see as you said you, uh, hdl cholesterol the uh, the as the functionality is very important when you want to raise the level by anacitrapib or carcitrapib by cetp inhibition you are reducing the functionality it is like having a bank account without eating you have a huge amount in the bank but you don't have food so it is hdl cholesterol goes up but it doesn't work at all that is what the anacitrapib or carcitrapib does so the reverse cause like uh, pathway itself is being inhibited keep high hdl uh, dr prabhakar if you lower the hdl ldl cholesterol so low the hdl also naturally goes down too much so that is also an irony sometimes we feel very sorry a person with an hdl above 55 70 now comes back with an hdl which is uh, less than like uh, 18 or 17 with an ldl also which is low so there was uh, absolutely don't worry about it absolutely yeah. whenever the total cholesterol comes down hdl will come down but it doesn't matter it will not create a problem because the primary cause because you are going to reduce it to such low levels only in secondary prevention where ldl is more important and one of the important things is that aspirin is out in primary prevention because of statins statins have stabilized the plaques ever since statins came aspirin is out because the original physicians trial there was no aspirin there was no statin 
that is when they showed that aspirin is useful so once the statin trial started coming in aspirin has been not found to be useful so statins also stabilize the plug which is the pleiotropic effect which dr sajay has been talking about so the pleiotropic effects are pretty important and uh, that is something that uh, we are still not yet come to terms with i think it's it's fantastic in probably to add to your point now madam the original hdl the breakthrough observation was hdl milano the village in italy where they showed hdl protected role that pedigree had actually hdl of around 15 to 18 only a very low hdl but highly functional hdl that is how the whole hdl theory started so the number is more important not important rather the functional is very important but this debate was going on and on for nearly two and a half decades now finally we have come to a point don't bother about hdl come to ldl which is also not fully right we need to way, find a way to make hdl active not uh, volume as well it's it's actually gone reverse mode what the european society of cardiology guideline last year has clearly gone ahead and said if the hdl is more than 90 it's actually a harmful factor because yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, that is true there's a very high level it can be harmful too low uh, hdl or too high hdl is not uh, beneficial in mm-hmm. fact i have a patient who had an uh, hdl of more than 70 and our pay my card is Yeah, I also I had uh, two women, uh, ladies who had HDL above hundred, so I was uh, wondering whether it's possible. So I kept on repeating in so many labs, and every time it came as above hundred. So I have been following up these ladies for twenty five years now. Okay, and uh, both of them never had CAD till now. One has lived up to eighty eight years, another is still living. The one who died developed a cerebral hemorrhage and died. she did not develop a, uh, cad and uh, you know this is a strange signal but i am telling this uh, super hdl le- uh, levels so anyway they did not do not have cad i do not know uh, the still it is protective who knows and uh, another concern for women okay i am the only woman uh, in this platform so uh, if you lower the ldl too low Uh, you may uh, prabhagar may laugh you know the skin texture goes bad with <laughs> bad you may feel uh, you know it is something uh, not very important for men but for women you know we are very much worried about our <laughs> looks and skin and all these things yeah so and many of the dermatologists also have told me i have actually checked with the dermatologists they also told me this very true now you cardiologists are prescribing high doses statins and these women come back and say their skin has become so bad uh, you know the skin texture has gone down wrinkles are coming so fast i do not know about the scientific base but i think that's also a concern dr sujay your comment on the <laughs> hemorrhagic thing that he said hemorrhagic stroke I, I, I'm not aware of any relation between high HDL and hemorrhagic stroke. No, no, LDL and the uh, hemorrhagic stroke that she was talking about. Madam, may I may I comment about that? Because you you spoke about that in your talk. Then I remember. Actually, okay. Let me let me take it. It's exactly the Sparkle trial which came up with that. In Sparkle trial, when they reduce the LDL cholesterol considerably, there is an increased incidence of hemorrhagic stroke. But the overall benefit was in favor of LDL lowering because the ischemic stroke was reduced much more than that. and there are a lot of questions as moderator i think you should go ahead with a lot of questions on the chat box and in the intervening period i think i have uh, replied to some of the some of the queries uh, yeah sure so please so that we can have a quicker dinner yeah go ahead and i i had i, I had replied to some of the queries in the chat box oh great great wonderful manu sir if you if you don't mind i think uh, we had a wonderful discussion and uh, you should uh, conclude the meeting because uh, Uh, as the arches of internal medicine says what dr shiba jaja has told if you type the word the advantages of using statin there are 33 million uh, articles but if you type the word the disadvantage of statin there are four times more articles absolutely <laughs> <laughs> so the skin specialist will say one thing everybody will say one thing but i think statins have come to stay as evidenced by the aspirin uh, that prabhakar was uh, mentioning and definitely it is advantages and not very disadvantages even if it is very low because even the pck is deficient population by birth pck is deficient population their uh, ldl is only between uh, 15 to 20 and they have absolutely no dementia no neurological deficit and no cancer increase so that is why they said it is better to lower it but i think i as cardiology still the time it is that disproved we should promote the theory that a lawyer is better thank you sir. so thank you sir bye bye
Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. And even uh, yes, sir. 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 Yes, <laughs> sir, not not only dinner, sir. Sir, mu- sir, musical evening is also there. So oh, I will right. just conclude. Right, sir. I, I am honored and privileged to be the part of this enriching session. As we conclude this deep light ACS meet on behalf of Torrent Pharma, I will like to convey my heartfelt gratitude to Dr. N. Shivakarasham, course director, all the esteemed faculties, and all delegates for ex- accepting our invite and sharing this vast experience and in-depth knowledge with us. we are sure today deliberation will definitely help you in your day to day clinical practice now i would like to invite you all for musical extravaganza to rejoice the evening with your family members you along with your family members are requested to log in in the musical extravagant link provided to you we are sharing that in the chat box so you can just log in and my colleague uh, yogesh will just show how to go about it so immediately you can log in for the musical evening yogesh yeah. good evening doctors uh, uh, i have shared the link in the uh, chat box also uh, so this is the registration page will open up when you once you click on this link after you uh, gets register yourself uh, uh, email id and password uh, once the login is done uh, this uh, have a look at this uh, uh, wonderful uh, auditorium uh, this uh, platform and and uh, uh, once you click on the auditorium you will be uh, taken to the musical extra vacancy event uh, so uh, it is about to start so let us join uh, this event and and click here to enter the event so thank you thank you and enjoy your dinner and uh, enjoy the musical night thanks doctor stay safe stay healthy kindly join in for the musical event thank you thank you so much thank you good night thank, thank you. you sir thanks thank you abhin thank you madam thank, thank you so good much night. thank you thank, thank you, you sir thank you so much good night it's a beautiful session here yes. thanks madam kindly join the link yeah, yeah. see actually i came to, uh, to my flat to because the uh, net connection is good here now to go back to my house my husband is there <laughs> by that means you can just log in madam so, yeah, yeah. bye bye bye, 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 bye okay. madam bye sir bye sir. thank you bye bye everybody bye, bye. bye.